Well, good morning again. Can you feel that it's happening? Can you feel that fall has taken one eyeball and peeked around the corner? And that's about as far as fall has gotten, but I think, I think something like that is happening. Um, well, my name is Todd Malone. I am the lead pastor here at FBC, and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning and every morning. And it is a pleasure to continue our series in the book of Ephesians. Um, we are in week three of that series. Each sermon in this series so far, I've done something that you may or may not have noticed to start the series. I have talked about the sorts of issues and people that have wandered into my office over the past couple of weeks. And that's very intentional. There's a reason for that. It's because in the first part of Ephesians, it seems incredibly theoretical. It seems incredibly impractical. There's nothing in the first part of Ephesians that gives us a list of things to do or assignments that we should take on or or responsibilities that we should execute. What Paul seems far more concerned about in this first part of Ephesians is how we think and what we value. And what I want us to remember, what I want us to keep in mind is that these things are actually incredibly practical to the sorts of issues that we deal with in our lives every day. You see, if our thinking isn't right, we are going to become a jumbled mess when Paul starts talking about what to do. Uh, This is a two-headed monster from Sesame Street. I believe that's his name, two-headed monster. Looks like two-headed monster is um, struggling a little bit with his shapes. Um, I like that picture because there is a two-headed monster that walks into my office almost every single day. I suspect, if I were to ask the staff, that this same two-headed monster is something that each one of the staff deals with in some form or fashion, if not every day, at least multiple times a week. And if I were to sit down with each one of you, I would suspect that you would tell me that this same two-headed monster shows up in your homes, with your family, it shows up with your friends, and it shows up in your own life constantly. It is the two-headed monster of pride and despair. It's, on the one hand, the, the monster of pride. These are the folks that have worked so hard to overcome their sins and their wounds and their obstacles in life. And, and they have this incredible tendency to compare themselves to other people around them. And they say to themselves, look how well I am doing. And then there's the monster of despair. And the monster of despair continues to struggle with sin, continues to struggle with the wounds that that have been inflicted on them in life, continues to struggle with the obstacles that they face, and they feel like they can never be radical enough, they can never be influential enough, they can never be good enough for God. That's the monster that I struggle with. It's the monster that I fight. And I say that this is a two-headed monster because it's really the same monster. At the heart of who this monster is, is a wrong understanding of who God is and who we are. And will inevitably show up in our lives in the form of either pride or despair. And this is the monster that Paul attacks in one of the most well-known passages in Scripture, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Before we get into it in detail, let's remind ourselves a little bit about what's going on in the book of Ephesians and what's going on behind the scenes in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians was uh, written 
to Christians in a city in Ephesus. Ephesus is, as we have seen, a very important city in the Roman Empire. Rome is up there somewhere off the map. Jesus and the disciples and Jesus' ministry was down here. So you can see that Ephesus is kind of in this unique place within the Roman Empire. It's a port city, so it was very important in bringing goods into that region of the Roman Empire. It was a financial district. It was very important for the distribution of currency and funding uh, of different enterprises within that part of the world. It was also famous for, for its pagan worship. This is the Temple of Artemis. On the right side are the ruins that you can see today. On the left side is a reconstruction of the temple. This temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Let me give you a, a sense of the scope of this thing. It's about as long as a football field and a half. It is 70 feet wider than a football field. There are 127 of these columns that are in that temple. And they are each 60 feet high. So before you get to the roof, you're looking at a structure that is somewhere between four and five stories tall. All around this temple, you had incredible artwork. Inside the temple, you had stunning bronze statues. There are records of a traveler who came to Ephesus and saw this temple, and he writes about he has seen all of these different famous places in the ancient world, and he said, but never have I seen anything like this. Surely, when Mount Olympus looks down on the world, this is the most extraordinary thing that it sees. So I want us to note something here. When we go into this passage and we talk about people being spiritually dead, it doesn't mean that they're not interested in spiritual things. These are incredibly sort of spiritually oriented people. What it means is that they are spiritually dead because they do not know and do not have a relationship with the one true God. And so Paul is writing to a group of Christians that have a background in this community. They have a background of living in wealth and comfort and of being incredibly spiritual, but spiritually misguided. And again, I want to suggest it's quite possible that the book of Ephesians might have something to say to us. Might have something to say to Christians living today in a culture like that. One of the things I'm going to encourage you to do, by the way, as we go through this sermon and we go through this passage, is keep a question at the forefront of your mind. Why is Paul writing this to Christians? Why isn't he writing this to non-Christians? Why is this relevant to people who are Christians? Keep that question at the forefront of your mind. The structure of Ephesians, as we have seen, is the first half is all about what God has done, and the second half is all about what the Ephesians do. Now, this drives us crazy in our culture because we want Paul to get right down to challenging us with assignments that will stretch us. We want Paul to tell us what to do. Tell us how to implement. Tell us what actions we need to take. But that is not what Paul does because he cares too much about how we think and what we value. And what we saw in week one is that what God is doing is he, he is uniting all things to himself. And he has given the, the Ephesians every blessing that is in heaven. He has given them every spiritual blessing is how Paul puts it. Week two, last week, Paul transitioned to a prayer that the Ephesians would know God because of this blessing, because they're united with him and one another, that they would know God, not just superficially, but they would know God deeply. And because they knew God deeply, because they experienced him relationally, they would know their hope. They would understand their value to God as his inheritance. And they would experience the power of God in their lives. 
And now as we get to week three, Paul is going to say, let's talk about that power and how that power is in effect in your life. And the way he sets this up is by talking about where they were before they knew Christ. And in sharing where they were before they knew Christ, he paints a very, very ugly picture. And he challenges them and challenges us that their situation is worse than they think. There is assumption that we have in our culture. And the assumption is that the reason that we have religion and Christianity gets lumped in here is to make us morally better people. I just saw a documentary. I just showed the staff part of the documentary this week. And in the documentary, there is, they show part of an interview with a politician. They show part of a very well-known TV talk show in a conversation that goes on on the air. And they show a very famous television preacher. And all three of them say the same thing. We are basically morally good people. And we have Christianity to help us be morally better people if we need help at all. And we see this in our culture constantly. We are constantly getting the message that we are basically good people, but we need help to make ourselves better. And Paul radically paints a different picture. When Paul goes to verse 1, the first thing he says right out of his mouth is that we were dead. It's interesting in the Greek that the word dead conveys the idea, the way that it's written in the grammar is that this is an ongoing condition. This is something that doesn't change. This is something that is going to be experienced day in and day out. They are dead. And it's important to start there because guess what? It has never, ever happened apart from one person that the dead made themselves undead. It says they are dead in the trespasses and sins. Those two words are basically synonymous, and here's what they mean. They mean a deliberate rebellion against God. And Paul is saying, you were dead because of and in the trespasses and sins that you lived in. It is both the cause of their spiritual death and is the condition of their spiritual death. You could think about it this way. If you saw someone in the water who had drowned, you would look at the water and say, that is both the cause of their death, and it is the sphere in which that dead body exists. And that's what Paul is saying here. Their rebellion, their defiance against God, their intentional actions of, of disobedience to God is both the cause of their death and that's the sphere in which they live. And Paul is saying, this is how you were. And it was your constant state that you could do nothing about. And then going on in verse two, he starts to explain how the spiritual death plays out in life. And he says, first of all, that they follow the course of the world. The world is a way of referring to that sphere, the people, the culture that disregards God, that doesn't want God as a part of their, of their thinking or their values. And so there's, Paul is saying, when you were spiritually dead, you walked, you lived by following the thinking and the values and the behaviors of your culture. And we do that, we see that all the time. Let me take just one example. What does it mean to live a successful life? What does it mean to be a success? What does our culture say the answer to that is? Our culture says the answer is going to be something like the money that you make, the influence or power that you have, 
the incredible experiences that you experience during your life, the relationships that you build. And the world falls right in with that thinking. And he is saying, as spiritually dead people, they are people that just follow the values, the thinking, the course of a world in rebellion to God. And then he ratchets it up the intensity. He said they follow the prince of the power of the air. That's weird language for us, but the original audience would have known what he's talking about. He is talking about Satan and spiritual evil. And what he is saying is that they follow the rule of Satan and spiritual evil. And they work right in the heart, right in the core, which is what he means by spirit, of the sons of disobedience. So what he is saying is Satan and spiritual evil goes to work right on the very core of who they are to make them people who live in disobedience, live in rebellion, live in defiance of God. And then he says one other thing about them. They lived in the passions of their flesh. It's interesting that Paul includes himself in that. We all, everyone, lived in the passage, passions of our flesh. See, what he is saying is you followed the course of the world. You were obedient to your spiritual master who was Satan and evil, and you liked it. That's his point here. You followed the course of the world. You were obedient to spiritual evil, and you liked it. See, flesh refers to that within us that is opposed to God. And Paul goes on to say that what you did is you carried out those desires. You even thought about them. Paul is saying that your condition is far worse than you could ever, ever imagine. And the result of that is that by nature, by who they were, they were children of wrath. Apart from Christ, a person is in complete rebellion against God. Their desires, their thinking, their actions are disobedient. And because of that, they are destined for God's wrath. Now, Let's talk about God's wrath for a second. Because that sounds like really harsh, very sometimes stereotyped language. What is God's wrath? God's wrath is giving them what they want. What do they want? They want life, existence apart from God. And God says, okay, I will give that to you for eternity. Now, I want you to think about the implications of that. What are the implications of the absence of the presence of God? There is no love. There is no goodness. There is no justice. There is no righteousness. There is no compassion. There is no mercy. Everything that God is the very essence of and the source of is gone. What does it mean to have an existence without love or goodness or justice or peace or kindness or mercy? That is what makes hell, hell. It's not just fire and brimstone. It is the very absence of everything that makes God, God, and that makes anything in life worth living. You see, the situation is far worse than we think. People are dead in their rebellion against God. They think and value and act just like the world. They think and value and act just as the spiritual evil that rules them wants them to, and they like it. You see, the underlying assumption behind pride is look how good I am. 
And the underlying assumption behind despair is look how good I can be, but I'm not. And Paul says to both monsters, wrong starting point. You are not spiritually well people who are just waiting to be empowered. You are not spiritually sick people who just need to make spiritual chicken soup to get well. Paul says, apart from Christ, we are spiritually dead. And dead people don't make themselves alive. But God does. And that's what Paul says next. The situation is worse than we think, but it is better than we hoped. Because of two of the most amazing words in all of the Bible. But God. But God. The core sentence of all of verses 1 through 10 is right here. But God made us alive together with Christ. Everything else in these entire 10 verses is either a build-up to that sentence or an explanation of it. Verse 4 starts off with a declaration of who God is. But God, he is rich in mercy. He has great love with which he loved us. The idea of mercy is to be concerned about someone who suffers in a disaster. So we have a friend of ours who lives in Houston. And what did we do the other day? We contacted this person to say, are you okay? Because you have suffered disaster. That's an act of mercy. And the person was fine. Jenny Kincaid's doing great. It is a kindness. It is reaching out. It is concern of someone who suffers disaster. And God has this unlimited concern about those who suffer the disaster of sin. And he demonstrates this concern. He demonstrates this mercy in the greatness of of his love. And there are three things that this passage tells us that God does because of his mercy. The first thing that it tells us he did is he made us alive. By making us alive, Paul uses terminology that applied to the birth of a baby. And notice that he made us alive together with Christ. In other words, God's grace is not just saving us as individuals. God is also creating a people. He is creating a community. He is bringing us together. There is more going on than just us and Jesus. And he did this by grace. He is reinforcing that the actions are because of God and not because of the Ephesians, not because of us. God responds to our, our being dead in sin with mercy. His motive is love, and the basis for his action is grace. The second thing it says that he did is that he raised us up with him. This is incredible language. When Jesus was resurrected, what Paul is saying is that we were spiritually present with him. I do not have the slightest idea what that actually means. But I know it means at least this. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead works in us to give us newness of life. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead takes people who were followers of a culture under the rule of spiritual evil and followers of spiritual evil and liked it and changing them into people who are becoming more and more like Christ. The third thing that it says that he did is that he seated us with him in the heavenly places. This is a statement about status and power. He is saying that because we were raised with him, because we were seated with him in the heavenly places, we are people who are able to overcome sin and death, not because of what we have done, but because we are in Christ Jesus. And the purpose for doing all of this 
is in verse 7. To display God's immeasurable riches of his grace. It says that he's going to do this in the coming ages. When is that? It's tempting to think that that's someday in the future. That's heaven. But what Paul is saying is from the second Jesus started making spiritually dead people alive. From that point on, every year, every day, every moment, God is displaying his grace, his love, and his mercy. And he is doing it by taking people who were followers of the world and Satan and transforming them into followers of Christ. You see, when your attitudes and values and thinking and behavior become more like Jesus, you are not earning God's favor. You are displaying God's favor. You are displaying his grace and his mercy. See, an underlying assumption that feeds the monster of pride and feeds the monster of despair is that God is not really as good as he claims to be. Despair fears that there are limits to God's mercy, to his love and grace, and pride doesn't believe that there's that big of a difference between God and ourselves. Our culture says that hope is in what we do. If you want hope, if you want favor with God, be a good person, be a nice person, be a generous person. And we carry that thinking right into the church. And we think that God is expecting us to be good enough for him. And so we have Christians who believe, you know what, and I'm doing it. And they're proud. And we have Christians who say, I could never, ever do it. And they live in despair. But Paul says, the situation is better than you hope. Stop trying to prove that you are something that you never were. Your life isn't a display of how good you are. You are spiritually dead without the Lord. And your life is a display that God made you alive with Christ. And that's the point of three of the most famous verses in all of the Bible. The point is that the implications are just the opposite of what we would expect. You see, what we expect is that we are accepted because of what we offer. Have you ever thought about how ingrained that is in our thinking? Have you ever thought about how ingrained that is in our culture? Have you ever noticed on Facebook how many times you read someone who says something like, I don't have any use for people like fill in the blank. People who are negative. People who have drama. People who think that way politically. People who believe that. And it didn't occur to me until I was working on this sermon. The implication of that statement, I don't have any use for. We are giving vocalization to the idea that people are only accepted if we have a use for them. Do you want to know how deep this goes in our culture? I'm about to get my wife extremely upset with me. The very first song she ever learned as a little girl was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Let me ask you a question. When did all the reindeer love him? When Santa found a use for his nose. That message is pervasive in our culture and in our thinking. You are loved when you are useful. And we apply that to our relationship with God, and it leaves us with either pride or despair. 
and verses 8 through 10 attack both. Verses 8 and 9 declare that salvation is a gift. There is no merit that we bring to it. We don't earn a gift. It is given to us despite what we do. It is not from our works. It is not from our doing. It means that it is from outside of us. It is something that is brought to us. We do not generate it. And the result, there is no room for pride. If we really understand that God's acceptance is a gift, if we really understand that it has nothing to do with what we do, there is no room for pride. And verse 10 frees us from the monster of despair that we are worthless to God and to others. It says that we are God's workmanship. That is a word that refers to craftsmanship. It refers to creation. It refers to making art. And the Ephesians every day, every day, could walk down the road and see an incredible example of that in the temple of Artemis. Every day they could see one of the most glorious pieces of craftsmanship, of art that ever existed in the ancient world. And what Paul is saying here is, you see that temple? You see how extraordinary that is? Guess what? You are God's craftsmanship. As extraordinary as that is, the creator of the universe crafted you. You are his artistry. And the reason that he crafted us was for good works. The word that's translated good works has the idea of of something that is morally good and beneficial to others. It it might be a word of encouragement to a friend. It might be standing up to, to injustice at work. It might be volunteering in children's ministry. It could be any number of things. And what Paul is saying is whatever you step into, understand this. God prepared them for you. God prepared that very thing for you before you even thought about them. And do you notice he doesn't say to work in them. He says to walk in them. Why does he say that? Because here's the idea. As we live in faith, as we live day to day, relying on God's power instead of our own, God works in us, and God works through us. We do not work for God. God works in us and through us to impact those around us. Paul writes Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, so the Ephesians will praise God for his immeasurable grace. Does it seem odd to you that he wrote this to Christians? Why? What are we supposed to do with this? Why do we need to be remembered that apart from Christ, we were spiritually dead? Why do we need to be reminded that God is the one who made us alive and he made us alive so that his glory could be displayed through the very works that we do that he has prepared for us by showing that we have been transformed into the character of Christ? Why? Because even as Christians, we must come back to this truth again and again to deepen our understanding of who God is and as a result, to fall more in love with him. I heard someone say, it's not the first time I heard it, but I was reminded of it this past week. The reason we sin is because we love it. And that sounds harsh, but it is good news. And it is good news for this reason. Because we have something. We have someone that is a more beautiful, more attractive, more wonderful object of love than any sin. And that is Jesus. And Paul wants us to remember This is who your God is. Fall more in love with him. I came to Christ when I was six years old. I was at the First Baptist Church in Willows, California. Pastor Bob Bilesma 
was the one who led me to Christ along with my mother. I am so grateful that I came to Christ when I was six years old. I wouldn't trade that for anything. But you know, there's a problem that I've lived with ever since. And the problem is this. I've never considered myself to be spiritually dead. I always considered myself to be kind of spiritually neutral or maybe a little sick. I mean, how bad can a six-year-old be? No, I mean seriously. (laughs) I wrote that and I said to myself, wait for response. (laughs) See, because I never appreciated that I was spiritually dead, even as a six-year-old, I was following the thinking and values of this world, and I was under the reign of spiritual evil, and I liked it. Even as a six-year-old. And the fact that I've never fully grasped that has meant that I have never fully grasped God's mercy, love, and grace in my life. And as a result, as Anne can tell you, I have spent most of my adult life trying to convince the people around me and God that I really am good enough, that I really am a good person. And Paul says, knock it off. Knock it off. That is not who you were, and that is not who God is. You were spiritually dead with nothing to offer. And you liked it that way. But God made you alive because he has mercy and loves you and on the basis of grace. And now more and more I'm trying to learn to live in the fact that I live for Christ, not to earn God's acceptance, but because I have God's acceptance. And that's the point of this very famous passage. God has made us alive. Here we go. God has made us who we are, that we might show who he is. When you lose all of the All the punctuation, it's hard to read that. God has made us who we are that we might show who who he is. Two things feed the two-headed monster of pride and despair. Thinking that we are healthier than we are and thinking that God is less than who he is. If we start with the assumption that we are really spiritually well or maybe just sick, we will believe that we are capable of being good enough for him. And we will be very proud of ourselves when we do something right. If we think that there are limits to God's mercy and love, we will think that we have to be good enough to keep our relationship with him. And we will live in despair when we realize that we can't. And the solution is to come back to Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, again and again and to soak in this passage, to memorize it, to let it sink in deeply so more and more it informs who we really are before God. Not because of what we have done, but because he made us alive. So how do we respond? I suggest first, and I'll probably suggest this for almost every passage, It would be great if by the time you got to the end of the book of Ephesians, you had rewritten the book of Ephesians in your own words. Rewrite this passage in your own words. It makes you think about what is Paul actually saying here. Spend some time prayerfully thinking through, meditating, reflecting on what good works is God calling me to do and then do them. He has prepared these for you in advance. Step forward in faith and do them. 
Pray through this passage. What do I mean by that? Go line by line through the passage and say, Lord, help me to understand the truth of what you are saying here and help that truth sink deeper into my heart that I might live it automatically. And then memorize verses 8 through 10. If you've already memorized those verses, go back and memorize verses 4 through 5. Those are really the core verses of this entire passage. Get that truth deep into your heart. It is the only defense that we have against pride and despair. We're going to close with one of my favorite, favorite hymns. Come Thou Fount. And this hymn is a reminder that the blessings that we have are not because of our performance and how good we are. The fount of our blessings is the grace of our Lord. Let's sing that together. Why don't we stand up? Here's what Paul said today. You were not spiritually neutral. You were not well. You were not just sick. You were spiritually dead. You followed the course of this culture. You obeyed your spiritual master who was evil, and you liked it, and that meant your destiny was destruction. But this is who our God is. But God. He responded to you with mercy because he loved you on the basis of grace. And what was true the moment you were saved is true today. That is who your God is. And as you leave here, I don't think Paul would want you to leave here with a to-do list. I think Paul would want you to leave here worshiping your God and loving him a little more. You're dismissed. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. If you need prayer for anything, please come forward and pray with us.